Hey everybody, this is Fabian, and today I have a very special guest in the podcast, which is a good friend of mine, Kelvin Becerra. Kelvin, I'm very, very pleased to have you here, and we have to say it's not the first time that you're here. That's right. Because uh, you've been here yesterday already, and we did an, an amazing <laughs> podcast just to find out that, that was we our, had... <laughs> that was our practice run, so it's exactly. all good. So we had a little technical issue, but uh, here we are, here we are live again. So thanks, thanks a lot for coming over because I know you have a flight going to Singapore in like one and a half hours yes. already. We have just been in Egypt together in a stadium full of 20,000 <laughs> people. It was a crazy experience, but uh, your journey or your trip doesn't end here. You just nope. spend a few days and now you go to yep. Singapore. It's a good way to, good way to uh, put some cushion in between my trips from Egypt to Singapore and stopping at this beautiful place we call Dubai. Because it's much closer, right? Yeah, yep, uh, exactly. If I would have had to flown all the way back home, it would have been an extra 19-hour flight to Singapore. So this is the halfway point from you know Egypt to to Dubai and then Dubai to Singapore. So I have a seven-hour flight, which is easy for me. And you could enjoy the 40 degrees Celsius a little bit here in Dubai. <laughs> amazing. Exactly. Cool. So yeah, it's amazing to to have you on the show because, I mean, we know each other for a long, long time already. And um, I, I need to tell the story again how I met you the first time, okay. which was like... My uh, my favorite experience. So uh, that was in uh, Berlin, and the I think it was the uh, Velodrome. It's called. Um, it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a big uh, event area. So we met there, and um, I didn't know you back in the days. You were like the superstar flying in. I only had my sponsor who was um, kind of bringing you in, promoting you, edifying you. And I was like, man, I need to talk to successful people. So I need to find a way to talk to him. And I knew that you were a guy who does a lot of athletics. You like sports. And I, I was doing CrossFit as well. So I thought maybe that's the that's the thing in common we have. So I took all my brave, came up to you and I said, hey, Kelvin, I heard you're doing CrossFit. And you're like, yeah, I'm doing it. He's like, awesome. And you're like, do you do it too? I said, yes. And he's like, keep up the good work, man. And you walked off. So <laughs> it was. I, I, must have, I must have been in a hurry or something because usually I, I do stop and I talk to everybody, you know, so I'm not sure, you know, why that happened, but. I'm glad you didn't give up on me at that point, man. <laughs> we became really good friends, like brothers. So, hey, it's like happened. <laughs> crazy, huh? It's five years ago. So, yeah, man. Like, it's, like, five, it's five years, but it seems like we've done so much together because we're traveling around the world together, building all these amazing teams, spending time with our wives on these beautiful, exotic locations the company sends us to. You know, uh, it's incredible. But, you know, I've been in the industry now for 13 years, and uh, it seems like it was just yesterday I got started, you know? So, I mean, time flies in this business. They say time flies when you're having fun. I'm having fun in this business. Exactly. And it doesn't feel like a business, right? No, 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 no. If, if you're honest, like, for example, I have a very good friend uh, I used to work for, like, uh, even though I was doing network marketing already, and he is very successful in what he does, but he's always posting pictures when he travels the world, uh, going to his manufacturers in Vietnam, in, in, in Korea, in India, and he's always by himself. <laughs> he posts a picture from the rooftop and he's by himself. By himself. If you look at our pictures, we're never alone. Dude, my my you know my friends at home that don't do the business, but there are friends you know, um, you know they say, man, like I can't believe that that's really your job, you know, or and and I know it's not a job, you know, but that's what you do for a living, you know, and uh, because this business in reality is it's just me traveling around the world, hanging out with friends, and building a business together, and then traveling around the world, not doing business. Um, on these exotic trips the company just sends us on. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm traveling around the world making friends and we're all building a business together. And you're right, I'm not alone. I'm with friends all the time, constantly surrounded by people. And I remember when when I was the first time in in Hawaii, like, uh, so so we were invited by the company and for me it was so special. And uh, I, I can't remember where I've seen each other before. I think it was like some convention or it was somewhere around the world. Okay. And it was only one week in between. So, and I meet you guys again, but for me, it was like, man, there you are again. <laughs> and, but for you and also for, for Dane and Stefan, it was so normal because you're so used to it. And I didn't understand it in the beginning because for me, it was so special meeting yeah. you at that special place. But then after a few months traveling the world, I meet you everywhere. I was like, man, it's like you live around the corner. <laughs> exactly. We, we're always running in each other. We're always seeing each other. We're always working together, you know? And uh, so that's the thing for, for, for me, usually it's just another place, another hotel, you know? But um, like you said, This business is really fulfilling for me because everywhere I go, I'm just surrounded by friends. And that's I build my business with my friends, you know? It's cool. I remember how, how um, Veronica yesterday was like so excited. She came into my room. Kelvin is here! Because I knew you were here, but I didn't yeah. tell her because, again, it was it, it's nothing special to have you in Dubai. I mean, don't get yeah. me wrong. It is special, 
but it's normal. Yeah, you know, it's normal. because it's we're the same thing when we're in California, we can knock your door anytime yeah, exactly. and say, Hey, here we are. <laughs> and it's like, we were living in the neighborhood, but let's talk a little bit about your, um, like, like, like your journey, because people always see and hear the good things, but they never hear about the bad things. Yeah. So you have been to, to wrap it up a little bit. You started a business, you came out of another business. We'll hear about in a second, but basically when you started a business, you were one of the most successful, fastest growing stars. You made your first million network marketing with the first nine months. That's what people know. But what people don't know is where you're coming from. Like, how did you make your way up and how many struggles have you had to actually be where you are today? Man. Well, um, okay. Thanks for allowing me to tell my story here. Um, You know, I always tell people that, you know, never try to compare yourself to the guy or the girl sitting next to you because you don't know their story. You see their success and you only want success for yourself. But until you know the story behind that success, you really don't know the recipe for how they got there. You know, and everybody has their own story. Some people start their story early in life, earlier than others, and other people have to just start where they are now. For me, um, my story to success started when I was a young kid, you know, eight years old. I grew up with my mom, my twin brother, Brandon, my younger sister, Amber. And uh, we grew up in the projects, you know, the, uh, you know, the projects uh, in the United States, that's like the very, very low income housing, you know, government assisted living, these, you know, just horrible looking housing projects with thousands and thousands of, of, of these little apartments or little homes, you know, that are given to the poorest people, you know, in America. And there are housing project communities everywhere. Um, usually they're hidden and they're usually in the ugliest places, you know, away from like the normal society, normal, mm. you know. So, so you didn't it's, grow up with the father actually. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, today, um, I have a great relationship with my dad, but my mom took us away from our family when we were young. They got divorced, you know, and she wanted to go just be, on, be by herself with her kids and raise us. <clears throat> and so we didn't have my dad in our life, you know. And um, so um, I didn't really, I didn't really, you know, have that kind of relationship with my dad until I went to college and then I was able to see him all the time because I went to university near him but growing up yeah just with my mom so there was no we had to be the 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 man of the house me and my brother you know we there was no father in our house and um you know I remember taking a trip to to where we moved to, no, to northern California okay and uh, the first thing we did when we got off the bus uh to get there was we went and stood in line for government assistant uh food stamps to get food free food uh we stood in line uh to get um on the list for low-income housing and then uh, and, and it took about a month for us to get into a housing project project community my mom spent 200 dollars to buy a car that we lived in for probably two or three months when we first got there we lived outside of a motel six and we lived inside the car and i remember almost every night the police officer would knock on our window and say hey ma'am you have to get these kids in a shelter somewhere you know and you know my mom would tell them oh it's just for tonight don't worry we're okay and um we just had to wait to get to get into that housing community you know and i remember getting so, to, so three kids yeah. and your mom in one car yeah crazy yep it was crazy man and i remember um you know we we got signed up for school and everything and eventually we got into the to the to the housing uh, community the projects and uh i just remember like just there being just very bad kids that, that were in there. There were fights every day. We hear gunshots all the time. Uh, there were gangs in there. And it was what me, me and my brother didn't want, you know? And I remember my mom was always crying and she was she was always depressed and worried because we didn't have enough money, you know? And we didn't have any money. The money ran out as soon as we got it. And uh, she just, her main focus was keeping a roof over our head, clothes on our back and food in our stomachs. And usually food in our stomachs meant maybe one time a day eating, you know? Mm. And most of the time it was cereal, you know, whether it was breakfast, lunch or dinner. But my mom tried hard, you know, to, to try to get jobs and to keep them, but she had to take care of us, you know, and it wasn't easy to keep a job. And I remember my brother and I at eight years old were like, let's go figure it out, you know? And, and at eight years old, we, we started working. We, it was our chance to really get out of the projects because we would be able to spend almost our entire day on the weekends and after school outside in the normal communities, knocking on doors, feeling like normal kids, you know? And just, uh, we're doing work. We'd knock on doors and ask if we could wash cars or do yard work or do anything to earn money so we can give it to our mom to pay the bills. And we did that. And we go to school every day and after school we'd work, do a couple little jobs and on the weekends we'd be gone all day. But, uh, that we helped our mom a ton because of that, you know? And then we got older and we went to high school and my mom always told us that we were going to be the first ones in our family to go to a university. And that was our ticket out to help our family, to change like that cycle, you know? And I remember because my mom really wanted us to go to university, I knew that we had to go to a good high school. And my brother and I found a private high school that was about an hour and a half away from where we lived. Okay. When you take the bus and the train and all those things, um, 
because my mom didn't have enough gas money for gas to be able to take us to school and back. Forget that. So my brother and I said, let's go see if we can get into this high school. Let's go take the test, the entrance exam, and see if we get accepted. And we went one day and we took it. <laughs> and uh, we took the test and we got accepted. And we were so happy, you know. And a couple weeks later, the official acceptance letter came in the mail. My mom was crying when she got it because she didn't know how to tell us that we got in and that she couldn't afford to send us to that school because she didn't tell us to go take that test. We did it on our own. And I remember... You know, we told our mom, like, don't worry, we're going to figure it out. We'll pay for our own school. We'll figure it out. How, how are you going to do this? It's $7,500 a year for each of you, you know? Today, that school is like $25,000 a year. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I, I remember us just going to, to Concord, California, where our high school was. It was called De La Salle High School in Concord, California. And it was a private all-boys high school. And uh, we applied at every, like, restaurant, every job you could think of to try to get jobs to pay for our school. And as a 15-year-old, you get a work permit. You can only work, I think, 15 hours a week, okay? Or maybe it might be even eight hours a week. I'm not sure because you're a student. You're a kid. You can't work that. It's a law. So my brother and I, we got accepted at all these different jobs, and we didn't tell the jobs that we had other jobs because mm -hmm. we wouldn't be able to do that. But we figured it out in our schedule. We fit three jobs a day into our schedule. And in the morning, we'd take the bus and the train to school to where our school was, and we'd run to our first job at like 6, 37 in the morning. And um, we were janitors, and we scrubbed the toilets, and we 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 vacuumed the floors, we swept the floors, we mopped the floors, we dusted off the desks and their computer screens and everything else. And then we'd empty the garbage cans, and we'd go to our first, we'd go to school. And um, we'd go to school, go to our sports practice. We, we did everything, wrestled, we played football, uh, we ran track, we played baseball. Uh, we ran cross country, which is long distance running. We did everything, you know, because we wanted to get a scholarship for something. Mm -hmm. And we, we did really well in school because we paid for it. And if we were paying for our school, that's we, a very good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we treated it like, like a business, you know, like exactly. why, if we're going to have to pay for this, why would we slack off? So we got straight A's. We were always on the honor roll. And, um, after school and practice was done, we'd go to the second job at a gas station where we pumped gas in cars and we changed the oil and fixed flat tires. And then when we were done there, we cleaned the shop up and closed the garage doors at the, at the shop for the mechanics. And then we'd run across the parking lot to a restaurant called Applebee's. And we were just hosts where we greeted people and sat them at their seats. And then we'd take the last bus home or last train home, you know, we'd run to the train station because there are no more buses running at 1130 at night. And then if we didn't make the train then we'd run back to that to where the gas station was and we'd, we'd, we had the key to the bathroom and we'd sleep in the bathroom until the next morning and uh, we'd go to school and try to do it again, you know, but every two weeks we'd get paid our paychecks and we'd mm -hmm. take them to our high school and, we, and we'd sign them over, pay to the order of De La Salle High School and we'd give it to the, to the accountants there, you know, and, and did, that paid did for they know that you were, that you were paying uh, for your own school I, or, you know, being a, a young kid, remember like uh, living in the projects, growing up the way I did, I didn't ever think like, do they know that I like, that was my normal, you know, so. Mm -hmm working three jobs and paying for my high school i never thought in my mind like do they know what i'm doing as a young kid like it was it was like it was just my normal you know when it when it wasn't a, today or, or, being the person i am today having having four kids you know i know it's not normal <laughs> so exactly. so so you would think I was, like i was just thinking yeah, i mean if they would have dude, known like the accountants they would be like man you, these kids but but think about gold you know yeah yeah i know um so i never that never crossed my mind but th being who i am today I know they must have thought, dang, these kids, like, they're, they're signing over their pay. They're paying for their own high school. Like, I, I would think they would go talk, talk to the dean and be like, let's help these kids out, you know, but yeah. never and, happened and they, like that. And they would give you a speech. Right? You know? yeah. They would say, like, yeah. In, yeah. inspire the others <laughs> who actually get paid by their rich parents and they don't give a shit about yeah, exactly. school. You know? Yeah, no, I've had, I've been invited back to that school several times now because they know our story, me and my brother mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and how it, you know, how we ended up. And they have us come talk to those kids now. Awesome. So, so they tell us to tell that story, you know. So that kind of gets me a little emotional, choked up because, um, just like uh, thinking about my kids, you know. And I wish that they, I wish they knew what I had to do, you know, uh, when I was a, when I, I know they'll figure it out later. But um, yeah, and I remember our senior year, bro. Mm -hmm. What was really cool was um, we were always nice to all the kids, you know. And all the kids that got bullied, we were nice to them, you know. And um, and I remember there's this kid. He's a Chinese kid. His name was Michael Chang, mm -hmm. and. Um, One day we went to go pay our tuition, our, the beginning of our senior year, fourth year of high school, our final year. And we went in there to sign over our checks. And they were like, um, your guys' school year is paid for now. Um, Michael Chang's mom came in here and wrote a check for you guys. Awesome. And I had never met his mom before in my life. Mm -hmm. I never hung out with Michael Chang. We were always nice to him. But he knew our story somehow. He saw, maybe all the kids probably knew, you know. But we didn't brag about it or talk about it, you know. Uh, and he knew our story. And he told his mom one day, and his mom just came and paid our tuition. I remember going up to her car window and, and knocking on her window, just saying, hey, Mrs. Chang, 
thank you for paying for our school. And she didn't even roll down her window. She just said, you know, a little nod, like, you're welcome. No worries, no worries, you're welcome. And uh, that was it. Our, our school year was paid for. And that was the best year of high school for me because I still went to work. It didn't mean I stopped working. Now I had money now I can have for myself to pay for my senior prom and to pay for my tuxedo and to pay to have gas in my car and all those things, you know, because we were able to get a car now. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was, it was an amazing um, gift that was given to us, you know. Mm -hmm. and but, it, but, but that's, a, that's a very interesting thing because um, you just mentioned two things. Like one is sometimes we don't know about the privileges we have because we just take things for granted. And, and you really worked for it. That That's like number one, which many, many people listening to that podcast should take something out of it. Second thing, what you just said, is um, that you now have another privilege because you can use your story to inspire others, which has a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. So, and third thing, by by being or by being blessed, you became a blessing, you know? Just, just that experience from Mrs. Chang, she helped you out and and also that i know that you help a lot of people nowadays and and i'm pretty sure that kind of influenced you as well having help from someone who couldn't yeah. when you couldn't help yourself right yeah i always think like i try to and and, and you know i want to thank her again and i want to meet michael and i want to say thanks man you changed my life you're what you did for me became part of my story you know in life because i pay it forward now you know um there are there are children in my in my you know daughter's school that you know i paid for their school they go to a private school uh two little girls because their dad and mom got separated and the dad moved away and the mom's you know with the kids and they can't afford their school now so i paid for them you know awesome. and then uh you know I, i always keep in contact with all the coaches like at the gym i work at they're high school coaches and they love me and my brother you know and our story and stuff and where we went to school de la salle and it's a really really uh, well-known school and i said hey you know i know that you guys are coaches at private schools if you have any good athletes that want to go to your school but they can't afford it um i told them you know I always tell them, just let me know because I'd love to like sponsor some kids, you know? And now uh, my brother and I just helped pay for two girls to go to a private high school called Notre Dame High School uh, in Riverside where we live and uh, super poor kids, you know, um, no dads in the house and uh, they're really good athletes and they just need a chance, you know? So we paid for their high school. Mm -hmm. So we're always trying to look ways to pay it forward in a way that uh, Michael Chang's mom did for me, you know? So that's pretty cool. So we do that all the time, you know? I just I just <laughs> spoke today actually in one of my uh, my videos for for Instagram. Um, I talked about the feeling you have if you really can give back. It's, a, it's something nobody can explain because the truth is, I grew up very in, in a very healthy family. Okay. So I always had everything I needed. I gave money to charity. Sometimes I gave money to 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 somebody who lives on the streets. So, but I never really had the feeling that I do a change with it. And then Veronica, since she has the the charity, yeah, like, and we're helping kids in Uganda, and you see the smile, you know, the the joy <laughs> they have for life. But they're sleeping like on the ground, they're sleeping on mud. They don't even mattresses. And so we finally we could buy the mattresses. We 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 brought 30 kids to school now. So we're wow. actually changing their life. And then again, when you think about the ripple effect, because everything you do right now will have an effect on 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 their on, on, on those kids' lives and what happens in the future. Just imagine one of them, whatever, becomes a doctor and saves so many lives. And and exactly. you are responsible for it somehow. Or somebody becomes a politician and changes the whole country. You don't know that, you know. But but it's because you you took the right decision and and really gave something back from the blessings you yeah, got. Exactly. So it's amazing. Uh, and, and like you said, both ways, you know, what I'm doing for what I'm doing for kids now, but also what Mrs. Chang did for me. She probably didn't know that it would help all these other kids, you know. Exactly. So that's that's really good insight, you know, that I never think about, you know. So let's but, let's uh, jump a few years okay. forward because um yep. So I, I know that you did many things successfully. You played football, right? Yeah. And I, I know there is a movie which is actually about your team. Is yeah. that correct? I remember <laughs> yeah, uh, I've seen it once. Yeah. yeah um, I put, so we played for De La Salle High School and it was a, a private uh, all boys high school, like I said, but we were in the top division uh, in California and we were ranked number one in the entire United States. There are thousands and thousands of high schools, you know, but football is a, a very popular sport in, in America, you know, and, um, and our team, had a, a streak of 181 games, you know, that, that, that were played and never lost, you know, and it was over like a 15 year span. And my junior year of high school, we broke the national record in the United States at 78 games. And even after I graduated, it went another few more years, but, uh, and the streak finally ended, you know, but, uh, that was a, a huge, like, that was a huge, you know, negative time for those kids that went to that school, my high school, when we, they finally lost because they were trying to just keep all the previous, you know, 
kids that went to that school and graduated and played for that team. Um, just proud, you know, to be the losing team, the one that finally loses. Like, how sad were those kids, you know? But the movie was about, you know, my uh, my team when I went there, the year that I went, the years that I went there, us winning that streak, winning a national championship, being on the cover of, you know, uh, of Sports Illustrated and all these things, you know, uh, USA Today. And, and, uh, and then the team finally losing and how they came and fought back, you know? And they ended up... Uh, winning the state championship, becoming national champions, even after that loss. But it was it was called When the Game Stands Tall. And I like the movie because it talks a lot about um, Coach Ladd. Coach Laddister was my coach. And he was like, he was the first taste I ever got of personal development in my life. He was always developing us, speaking those things into us, like in the locker room, at halftime, at practice. And I think that personal development shaped a lot of the kids on my team. You know, a lot of guys played pro football. All my friends who went to that school, he was also one of my religion teachers. And... um like everyone became successful. It's crazy. You know, everybody, all my friends became successful. It's just a really, really, really good school. But did somebody play you in the movie? Uh, <laughs> or <laughs> you know, I, I don't I when I when you watch the movie, I remember the position uh were played by two totally different like ethnic background kids that didn't even look like me at all, you know. But and, and my brother and I, you know, he was a wide receiver, I was a cornerback, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, but no, just totally different characters and stuff in there. But it was it was really cool. They did show the real footage though of the some of the games and the celebration after we won the national championship. And it was just it's really, really cool, you know, but but it's um we we you know we had to experience a lot when going to that school. And I remember the final year of our high school, all the teams in our league said they were gonna forfeit against us because we beat them all the time and we hurt their guys. So the whole league forfeited our entire season. So the coach said, Okay, cool. If we if they are gonna they're gonna forfeit us in the league, we're gonna play the top ten teams all across the country then. That's mm -hmm. going to be our season. You know, usually when you play on a high school team, you play in your local area, yeah, you know? Yeah. We played the top 10 teams in the nation and everybody said, oh, they're the best team because they have the easiest league they play in in, in, in Northern California. And we beat all 10 of those top teams, you know? So it's just, it's a cool experience, you know? That you're getting, you're helping me relive right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but but because of that school and everything I did, uh, my brother and I ended up getting full paid scholarships to, to our university. So we ended up going to university like my mom wanted for us. Uh, and we got the best grades. So we got full paid scholarships for our academic Academics, but also for sports because we were two of the best athletes, you know, and uh, we went to a private university. We both got our degrees. I got my degree in criminology and pre-law, which is what my brother did because we were going to become police officers, you mm -hmm. know, and we were we were cadets and explorers at the local police department in Anaheim, California. Mm -hmm. And uh, then my brother went and became a police officer uh, in a very, very like, uh, um, like a very, very poor area, you know, mm -hmm. so it was like kind of like going back to where we were as kids and he went to be a police officer in an area like that. By the way, I remember one story, uh, which, which you know, makes it a little bit more clear. I remember I was uh, visiting you and I uh, got a rental car. And uh, we went together to that place to, to pick up the, the rental car. And I was waiting inside for the car and you were actually outside. Yeah. And just when I came back, I, I, I saw like a guy uh, walking away and there was a girl also. And then you just told me that this guy was beating the girl. I don't know if you even remember. Oh. And, uh, and you intervened which is something what I also do or did a lot in my life, but it's very seldom that somebody really goes into it, puts themselves in danger to um, to help out. But, but obviously now <laughs> it makes sense why you have that feeling for what is right, what is wrong. <laughs> and uh, so, so you went right there and, and helped that lady, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't I remember that. It's crazy, man. But yeah, like maybe my instinct took over, took over, you know, but yeah, I'm always wanting to help people. And I don't like people. I don't like to see people getting hurt, you know. And I think part of my story too that I don't tell a lot is some experiences I had to live as a kid, you know. But um, but yeah. So I went to university. I, yeah. So I didn't become a police officer. My brother did, and I wanted to really change my life in a big way. Okay. Even though I wanted to be a police officer, my dad's a police officer, a retired police officer. So we we had a connection with with our dad at that point, just building a new relationship with him. And I wanted to make him proud and do the same thing he did. But at the, the last minute, I decided that I wanted more for my life. And so I wanted to do, get involved in real estate, okay? And I remember going to a, to a successful real estate company in Southern California and asking if I can have a job there. And I had no experience at all. I was only 21 years old. And the owner said, you know what? How much experience do you have? And I said, none. But I'm the hardest worker you've never met. I just graduated from one of the best universities. And I promise you that I won't let you down. If you just give me a desk and let me listen, um, I'll learn your business. And he said, okay. Good. Okay. So, so, so you went in there with a lot of self confidence. Yeah, actually. yeah, I okay. did, I did, and um, and he gave me a desk in the very back by the worst performing people in that office. But 
but I learned a lot from just listening to them on their phone calls, how they handled objections, how they spoke to customers, how they problem solved and how they got the deal or the job closed. And um, I learned just from listening and I would go out and market myself as a real estate person or a mortgage person and I would get deals to bring in and the owner would help me at the end of the night put the deals together and I learned the business. You know, in my first year, I made $110,000 which to me was rich, you know, because I don't think my mom ever made more than maybe 10000 in a year, you know? Mm -hmm. And then uh, my second year, uh, he gave me my own office and I made half a million dollars. And then my third year, I went and became, I, I started my own company. And then that's when I made my first million. I made 1.6 million. The next year, I made over a, one and a half million. And the third year, the same. And then um, in 2007, uh, the financial crisis happened and the market crashed in the United States. And it didn't matter how many clients I had or how good of a professional I was in that business. Nobody can get approved for loans at that point, and nobody could buy homes. People were losing homes, including myself. You know, I, I had eight homes, mm -hmm. and I lost all of them. You know, I had to claim bankruptcy, and I was at the bottom of the world. You know, and the people in my houses they couldn't afford to pay the rent, and I don't want to kick them out because they were in the same situation as me. And eventually, I just lost everything. You know, and uh, and uh, perfect how, for me. That how how was the feeling? Because I mean, that's that's kind of a dream situation, right? People buy homes. And they feel secure. They feel like I'm on my way to financial freedom. I yeah. finally have like uh, multiple million dollars of assets. Nothing can happen to me. And then everything's taken away. Man, like I swear I felt like a loser, you know, but um, as soon as I started to realize that a lot of people were going through the same thing, then I felt normal again, you know, but at first I was like, man, how could I let this happen? You know, I should have been smarter with my money. Why didn't I think? Why did I go too big? And, um, but, you know, I think it was just another chapter in my life that was closed and ready for me to start a new one. You know, I, I was, re I'm resilient because I've always had a work ethic. So I knew that my business and my money could all be gone, but no one's going to take away my work ethic. What's next for me. And I just prayed for something big, you know, in my life that would be handed, given to me or offered to me in some way. And, and then I meet, meet uh, my next door neighbor who shares, shows me the next chapter of my life, which is network marketing, you know? Mm -hmm. how, how, how did it happen? I mean, there's, this guy just knocks your door and yeah. says, here I, I am, or? He just moved in next door to me, and I lived in a very nice uh, neighborhood. <clears throat> um, so I had, a, I had a beautiful house. I was a, I was just like, a, uh, I had a girlfriend. I wasn't married at all, no kids. Um, I had, you know, nice cars on the driveway. So he thought, man, this young guy is successful. I need to talk to this guy, get him in my business. He didn't realize I was losing everything that he's looking at right there, you know? And um He moved in next door and we just had small talk, you know, hey, what do you do for a living? My name is this, my name is that. Um, you know, how long have you lived here? Just small talk, getting to know each other. And then, uh, you know, I told him, you know, I was a real estate agent and I didn't tell him how unsuccessful I was at that point <laughs> because I was losing everything. Um, after having a lot of success, I'd made everything seem like it was perfect, you know, like any new person would. You don't want to tell someone. Somebody asks you, how falling. are you doing? Great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly right. And uh And, you know, and then I asked him what he did and he said, you know, he, he, he had been involved in, uh, you know, the real estate business as well in a different uh, form than I was and uh, that his business was just going down, being flushed down the toilet because of the economy. But fortunately for him, his friend who had, he hadn't spoke to in 12 years shared with him this company and this business called Network Marketing. And he was so excited about it, you know, and um, he didn't share with me what the company was or what the products were. He just shared with me his vision, which was really important for me because uh, at a time when people were losing everything and people had lost the, their vision, uh, this guy had a big vision and that's what attracted me. And he said, you know what, this company is amazing. You know, I'd only, I only just started it, but a year from now, I'm going to be financially free mm. because of it. Uh, my wife's not going to have to work anymore. I'm going to be able to raise my daughter the way I want to raise her. And it's, it's, it's going to be a dream for me. And then, here's, uh, here's another interesting thing. Again, we're talking about the ripple effect. So this guy who hasn't seen his friend for more than 12 years is brave enough to talk to him. Not only this guy becomes a multimillionaire network marketing later, but he enrolls you who has more than 2 million people in your organization nowadays. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? That this guy must be very happy. <laughs> We It haven't is. seen him for 12 years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And now that guy who who he hadn't seen in 12 years is my friend now, you know, in the, in the business, you know, and yours as well. Mm -hmm. But um, But yeah, so everything happens for a reason. And You know, he didn't share with me the business. He he gave me a little taste of what he was doing, which was very smart of, of, for him because there, there's that question people say, you know, do you know how to eat an elephant? And the answer is one bite at a time, not all at once, you know? And most people in, in this business try to feed people the entire picture, the entire movie in one bite, in one sitting, the elephant. And uh, he just gave me one bite at a time. He shared with me his vision. That was it. And then he said, hey, when I have some time, I'll share more with you. And uh, that was it. He's like, he gave it to me and took it away. Mm -hmm. And um, and for me, uh, the timing was right 
because I had lost everything and I needed something, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and so, but, but I still didn't know anything was gonna be offered to me in form of a business. Okay. But my ears were open. And, uh, then, then my girlfriend and I, at the time, we took a, a vacation for a week and our friend house sit at our home and watched our two little dogs that we had. And when we came back home, there was a note she'd already left and said, Hey, your neighbor, uh, came by and shared this product with you. He wants you to, to finish this in a week. And it was his company's product. And uh, I remember looking at the product. Now I was by myself without him. I was able. I, I did a little research on what was in it. I wanted to see what was in it. And it and it became more than just a product to me. And I I used the product. I liked it. And a week later, he followed up with me and said, "Hey, what'd you think about that?" And I said, "Hey, it was great. I want to buy more from you." And I just wanted to be nice and reciprocate the gift back to him and just buy more of whatever it was he was selling. And he said, "I don't sell it." He said, uh, "I shared that with you, but I want to show you the business behind it. It can change your life." And those five words were important to me because I needed a life change at that at that point at that point, you know. And uh, he would invite me to a meeting after a meeting after a meeting, but I didn't want to go to a meeting, you know. And uh, I, I I always thought I didn't have enough time. I didn't want to go to a meeting. I wanted him to tell me there, you know. And uh, but that was how this business worked. You invite someone to a meeting, you sit down, you share the opportunity, then you could get signed up. And um, I would always have a new excuse for him every time he would invite me to a meeting for the next three weeks. And then finally, he got smart and did the smartest thing he ever did that changed his life forever. He said, okay, you know what? Well, if you can't go on Tuesday, you can't go on Thursday, what, do you, what, are, you, what are you doing tonight? And I didn't have an excuse at that point. <laughs> and uh, I said, I don't have anything going on. He said, okay, be in front of your house at seven and, you know, and I'm going to pick you up. We're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the meeting myself. And I thought, wow, this guy's like really serious, you know? And um, but what did you expect? Like a big meeting or yeah, like more people coming? I thought it was a big meeting. I thought it was mm -hmm. somewhere full. I don't know. I didn't know how these things worked, you know, network marketing. And um, so... You know, a few hours later, I was in my front of my uh, front of my garage, and he picked me up. And you know, 15 minutes later, I was in his best friend's living room with nobody doing a meeting. They just pushed in a DVD into the video player, and they pressed play. And in 15 minutes, he said, "Hey, uh, I I want to show you what I'm so serious and excited about." And he just pressed play, and uh, I watched the video in 15 minutes. And in 15 minutes, I got a real picture of what this business really was. You know, um, I saw that. It, I saw an incre incredible product, okay, with science behind it. I saw a really cool corporate team that I wanted to to get to know. I want to know who these guys were who created this billion dollar company. And then, um, and then also I saw people that were successful. And I remember this girl Holly on there saying, you know, this is my first time doing network marketing. I enrolled 44 people to have a team of 4,000. I'm a millionaire in this company. And that was the that right there was the was was the recipe right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I knew that I could. It was an incredible company, incredible product. And now I knew how to how to build a business, you know, without him actually telling you, without him telling me, you know, that's, and that's that's so interesting. Like looking back, how easy do we have it today? And in social media times, and uh, we have WhatsApp, we have Facebook, we have YouTube, we have all that. I mean, TikTok is coming out now. Yep. So the world is changing, but it's not so long ago. We're talking about how much? Ten years? Yeah, uh, actually, thirteen years ago. Thirteen years, yeah. and and people needed to have a DVD player. Exactly. Put something in what you needed to pay for. Yep. which was not for free. You needed to buy those things, right? And uh, and to show it to someone. It's crazy how yep. it changed. And now everything's free. You can just jump on Facebook Live and do a meeting. You know, exactly. right now, if you want to, we didn't, I didn't even have a Facebook then. Uh, you know, you just sh send a quick link through text and it's free. The video is free. You're right. Everything is at your fingertips today, but people still have the same excuses they did 13 years ago on why they can't make things happen. It's just all about taking action. Everything's getting easier, but people are still the same. True. It does, doesn't matter. People are always the same. You know? I, I remember that one CD, which was called The First Look. Okay. It was actually an audio. I don't know if you if yeah, you remember. I remember. It was yep. an MP3 yep. yeah. in CD, what you could give to people. They could listen it in their CD player in their car, basically. And it was like an audio recorded explaining what network marketing is, <laughs> what the business is. Uh, crazy. Nowadays, I mean, we're just recording a podcast at my house. And everybody who wants to can 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 watch it. You yes, know? exactly. But it's crazy how, how everything changed. Yeah. And I just remember that was very simple for me, you know. And um, in, in a way... I was also I was maybe even more fortunate that he didn't do a full out meeting in front of me because that little process that he took me through in 15 minutes, 20 minutes was easy. I thought mm -hmm. I can replicate this, duplicate whatever just happened. That's easy, you know. Um, as I got more experience, I knew how to answer questions and I knew how to share the presentation myself if I had to sit with someone one on one. But it's just very simple steps. And I remember um, when I got started in network marketing, I had a huge goal, you know, but I didn't know what to do. But he was very smart and just 
only letting me look two steps in front of where I was mm-hmm. at that moment. You know, keeping things simple, step by step, getting to that long term goal. But over a series of steps, I'd eventually get there. And I kept the business simple. I had fun with it. I didn't try to become someone different than I already was. You know, um, I had already been an entrepreneur. Um, I didn't try to just be the product expert or the compensation plan expert or the network marketing expert. I just was me. You know, excited about a new business that I wanted to share with everybody, and that's what that's what attracted people. Mm-hmm. So super interesting. Um, if if you follow the whole process, so he actually let's call it the bikini method. Yeah. So he he showed you a lot, but not everything. If you know what yeah, I mean, yeah. you know. Yeah. Like you go you go you go on the beach and you see the girls in bikini, <laughs> you know, and and you're like, I can almost see everything. It's ninety percent, but I want to know what are the last ten percent, right? <laughs> so and uh, and 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 he fed you step by step until you took the decision and say, okay, uh, that's the thing I want. So so, but but how did you start? I mean, you. St- You just said he helped you a little bit, but you were much more successful than he was because you grew quicker. Oh, yeah. So h- how did that come? Um, so, um, you know, when I started, uh, I, like I said, I kept it simple. Of course, you know, everyone thinks it doesn't matter who you are, how successful you are, wherever you're coming from. When you start network marketing, you always start with your friends and family. And you think they're going to be the ticket. I got the best friend over here who does this. And that's really where you get all your practice your friends and family. You know, <laughs> that's where you get all of your no's and all of your excuses. And True. that's where you really learn how to problem solver, how to handle objections or how to, how to give good responses through practicing on them, you know? And it's when you're through your friends and family, your business really starts. You have to go market your business, network marketing, you know, just like any company or any product that or service that you have to go out and offer. And, um, so, um, you know, I just wasn't afraid to fail. That was my, I wasn't afraid of hearing no, the more no's I got, the stronger I got, the thicker my skin, you know, became. And, um, yeah, I, I enrolled 40 people my first year. But I had to speak to maybe 100 or 140, you know, and most of those were no's. Only a small amount were yeses. And of the yeses, the people that joined me, an even smaller amount actually took action, right? So, but I just knew my numbers. I knew the recipe. As I started to grow and build my business, I knew what it took to sign up one new person. I would have to go share the business with five, mm-hmm. you know, and I, and I actually knew what it took to find one good leader. I would actually have to go and personally enroll 10 Mm-hmm. And I actually knew what it took to find one superstar. I don't have to enroll 40 each year to find one new person mm-hmm. each year. So once I understood the numbers, I knew how this business worked, you know. Um, it's taking a lot of action, but a small percentage of success gives you a huge income in network marketing. You know, and, it's, and, and of course, it's learning the skills. I had to learn the skills, yeah. yeah. Because you just said, Holly, she enrolled 44, she yeah. became a millionaire. You enrolled 40, you became a millionaire. Yeah. But just enrolling 40 people doesn't make you a successful person. You need to know how to work with them and True how that. to leverage them, right? True that. I, I, was, I was very supportive of my team when they got started, you know. Uh, I remember, you know, um, I... I would always follow up with people after enrolling them and show them, you know, how the back office works, you know, how to get people started, where to find the tools that they need to go build their business. I remember doing their first, you know, their first meetings for them and their one-on-one so they could shadow me. You know, I, I, I helped them get a lot of experience just through watching what I did so they can go out and, and replicate that. I didn't just sign and burn, as you call it, you know, when you just mm-hmm. enroll someone and let them go. Uh, I would really t- walk them through a process of really getting them trained up so they can go out and do it. Mm-hmm. And I was learning the entire time too. You know, promoting events and doing those things that I didn't do at the beginning. I remember every any time there was an event, I just made sure I was there mm-hmm. and I expected everyone else to get there. They got the same email I did. You know, they heard the same guy promote the event that, that I did. Why aren't they all here? And then I realized how important me promoting the event was and getting people mm-hmm. there, you know? so but, but you also learned your first lesson after yeah. how long? Like one year? Yeah. Your business didn't work anymore when you were not there because you were basically yeah. doing all the work, right? Yeah, I had to, uh, I've had to rebuild my business several times in network marketing. I think any successful entrepreneur has had to rebuild and rebuild uh, to create something that's worthwhile, you know, and huge in, in success. But yeah, I know my first year of network marketing was me doing a lot for everybody, me actually doing too much. I was doing all the meetings and all the trainings and all the one-on-ones. I was almost handicapping people because that was a problem I had in my life, my, probably my entire life. I, I was used to doing everything. And uh, I loved helping people so much that in, in a way, I didn't want people to mess up. I didn't want people to do it wrong. I thought I did it the best, the right way. Uh, so I wanted them to be successful, but I also wanted to be successful myself. So I just thought I would do everything for everyone. And uh, man, I was everywhere, every second in building this business. And after my first year, I became a millionaire in this, in this industry. Uh, I decided to take a little break, but I realized that when I took a break, so did my business because no one was working because I'd never empowered them or enabled them to work uh, or, 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 or even taught them how to do those things. 
or or gave them the permission, I guess, you know, so they just waited for me. And so what I had to do now was I had to rebuild my business a second time, but this time empower people. And I remember when I would enroll people, I would say, you have 30 days, all access to me, my calendar. You could put me in front of any of your friends, get me on any phone call. You could uh, have me do any meeting for you. I'll do everything for you. I'll answer any questions for you. I'll walk you through whatever you want. 30 day access to me. But after 30 days, you're on your own right? And I would do that. And then what happened was I found that I had more success that way because now my business ran without me mm. when I wasn't there. And I would empower people and develop leaders, you know? So that was the, the very first time I had to rebuild my business. Mm. But then something else happened because your sponsor actually decided to, hey, yeah. I'm going to do something else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he had a lot of success. He didn't, he didn't say, I'm going to not do network marketing anymore. I'm not going to do this company anymore because I'm, uh, my business fell apart, you know? which is what I could have done. Um, he said, I'm having so much success. I want to go start my own network marketing company now, like as if it were so easy, you know? And uh, he learned actually very quickly, actually eight months later that it wasn't easy because that company bankrupted, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but he decided, he said that, uh, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go uh, start my own company and you're going to come with me. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm here. This is where I planted my flag. I'm going to build this, this company. And he said, well, if you don't come, I'm taking your entire team, you know? And he did that because they, they didn't have the willpower. They weren't empowered yet that first year. I was doing everything for them. So they thought they had to follow that leader. I edified him so much, you know, and then I, I, I had to rebuild my business and, and then I empowered people now mm -hmm. to take control of their own life and their own business. And this is where they're going to plant their flag. It's also a strong lesson, I guess, because I remember seeing that, uh, like it was called the black diamond documentary. Yeah. It was a little bit like my crib and yeah, MTV. MTV Cribs. <laughs> so they came uh, visiting you and they, they showed you training in the morning with that guy. Right. Yeah. So you were actually, you were close friends. Yeah, I know. So, but, but then it, it, you're talking about the money part and then friendship wasn't worth it for, it, it's crazy, right? Yeah. How people sometimes react, but, but now you're friends again. Um, we're, we're, we're not like close friends at all, you know, like, um, but we're friends, you know, but, um, that experience taught me to keep my guard up with, with, yeah. with, with someone like him, you know, I mean, um, it's funny. You learn a lot about people in this business too, you know, the ones that are, that are your friend when you're making them money, you know, and then. When you're not, they're not anymore. It's crazy, mm. which is the wrong way, obviously, to do business. Mm. But um, um, but I remember I've had to rebuild my business even more, many more times than that. But but the thing is, is that I'm not talking about completely rebuilding and restoring my business. I'm just talking about my business going backwards and me having to build it again and build it again and just make it stronger and stronger mm. with, with each time. And I remember I built a, a very good business that second time I built it. It took me two years to do what I did in my first eight months, but now I had empowered people. And I remember meeting a mentor that told me, hey, Calvin, uh, a very successful network marketer gets paid 24 hours a day, whether they're awake or whether they're sleeping. Your business pays you on your time zone and that's it. Mm. And so it made me think a lot, you know, and he said, you should, you should build a business that looks like the world and not that looks just like you. Mm. And it, what it, I know you have a business like the world. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're flying to Singapore tomorrow. Exactly. Meeting people from what Malaysia, India, yeah. uh, Singapore itself. Uh, yeah. Um, I've, yeah. All my leaders will be there. Like I said, I'm everywhere I go. I'm surrounded by new friends, my friends in my business, you know, yeah. everywhere I go. But um, I just, uh, you know, I started to just start building local, but thinking globally. Mm -hmm. And I started to sponsor people with different skin colors, different ethnicities, different religions, you know, different cultures, uh, because I wanted a business that would that would spread around the world. And I built in my local markets, you know, I remember, you know, meeting, you know, European Americans. Uh, I remember meeting Chinese Americans um, and all these, and I started just enrolling people. I spent that whole year enrolling a, a business that looked like the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. And literally within three years from that year, my business spread into 14 countries. Mm -hmm. And now today, 13 years later in more than 150 countries with over 2 million people worldwide, tons of different languages and religions and skin colors and ethnicities. It's crazy. But that, that, lesson and that, that that mentor taught me did come true because I took action. And, um, you know, because of that, I have you guys here in Dubai with your business in Germany and all throughout Europe and the world. You know, I have, um, because of meeting a uh, Chinese American woman in my church, I have a business all throughout Asia now, you know, mm -hmm. there's, I have businesses all around the world because of just me taking action with that simple lesson, you know, and I rebuilt my business again. But it's still interesting because most people, especially nowadays in globalization, they look at, oh, I'm going to build my business online. I'm going to meet people online and I spread around. But basically you've done your first million dollars in your village. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In my own backyard. In my yeah. own backyard, I built my first million dollar business in network marketing within a three hour driving radius of my home. That mm -hmm. was it. You know, I never went out of my state. Uh, I didn't have to go out of my, I never even left the country ever in my life. Mm -hmm. in, in, uh, if it wasn't for network marketing, I wouldn't have two full passports with double pages in them all stamped, you know? Um, 
but yeah, I built my business in my backyard for my entire first year. And then when, you know, I, that mentor taught me how to build a business that looked like the world. It took me all around the world, literally, you know, <laughs> but, but you also had around how many million dollar earners in your area? Oh yeah. So in my city, there were eight of us mm. in my little town. It was 130,000 people in the town I live in Corona and eight were millionaires all on different teams too, mm. you know? So it's, it's, it's just, I mean, people don't know, really understand that network marketing is bigger than they think, you know, and there are more successful uh. people around them than they know. I mean, even here in Dubai, we have the highest density of top leaders in network marketing, not only in our company. I mean, we, are, we have like six million dollar earners living in Dubai, yeah. only from our team, basically. But then there are so many others uh, from other companies living here. It's crazy. And then you meet those guys somewhere, you go out and, hey, you see yeah. somebody from the industry. It's crazy. It's crazy, right? Yeah. And uh, like I said, and, and people, they think that they don't know anyone who does network marketing, but chances are most people they know are in some type of home-based business network marketing. And you everybody know. has products at home anyways. Yeah, exactly. You know, especially in, in Germany, we have that cooking machine called the Thermomix. Okay. I don't know what's the, uh, in, in Italy, it's Bimbi. I don't know what they're, how they're launching it in the US right now, but okay. every third household has one and it's direct sales. Wow. They just don't know about it. Okay. You know, it's crazy. Yep. But that wasn't the last time you rebuilt because I was part of, I think the last time when you had to rebuild it. Yeah. So actually I, I joined in, uh, I joined the company uh like five almost six years ago that was that was my my thing so when i met you and uh then we became friends and you mentored me as well a little bit so and and i remember i was working in it one and a half years i was really believing in it and then we had a great message it was like okay we're gonna restructure everything we're gonna launch a new company it was called a mint yep. if i can say the name because it doesn't exist anymore yeah. it never existed actually <laughs> which was all about sports products so i was working in the sports industry and i built like really hard And then when the launch was in the U.S., suddenly from one day to the other, we had like 4,000 people coming in, like suddenly appearing. And because we have a binary system, yeah. so suddenly they appeared. I was like, man, where are they coming from? And I clicked through and I sponsored Kevin Becerra, Kevin Becerra, Kevin Becerra. <laughs> so you've built like uh, within the shades, like over, like in the dark, yeah, yeah. without telling anyone, you've built a few thousand people for that new company. Yeah. I mean, that was crazy. That was a real rebuild. Of you know? course, yeah. And we were all so impressed. How do you do that? I just, I just... um Like I reinvented myself, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's what most people need to constantly do in this business. You know, they think if they build a business once and it starts to go away, that it's the end for them. But you just have to reinvent yourself again. Find a new reason to get excited. Find a new product line that you're going to launch like it's a new company. Get people excited. People love new, you know, that new car smell. So I just treated a new product line like it was a new company. And people loved it. And I focused on that product line only. I built a community around that product line. And the person who created it, Mark McDonald, and and uh, people were just attracted to it, you know, and I and I did it. I've I've had to, like I said, reinvent myself many times, you know, and, and I just built a, a huge, a huge organization that way, you know. Mm -hmm. And then again, I had to rebuild again when our company actually got purchased by my current company. And um, I remember I, that day. Yeah, you remember that day, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I told you what I, when I met you in uh, Pico Rivera, right? Yeah, the, 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 in the ghetto. So we yeah. had an Airbnb. I was there for uh, a convention, like a fitness convention. And I called you and uh, you brought me the products. So you basically came into the Airbnb so that we could start and launch that, that new product line in Germany because we had no products. So you came in, dropped the bags and said, I got news for you. We just got acquired. <laughs> like, like, what does it mean? Yeah. I mean, like, maybe I don't think the new company will ever even exist. And I don't know where we're going to, but I'm super excited. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what is it about? Is it fitness? And he said, I don't know. It could be cosmetics. <laughs> so that was like my, my introduction, but I was still very small <laughs> in, in network marketing. Yeah. And I just said, hey. If Kelvin is doing it, if uh, my sponsor Danian is doing it, so I just follow these guys because I trust in them. Yeah. They trusted in me, so let's let's take a decision. Let's 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 go that way. Yeah, and I think that was one of the toughest decisions I ever had to make because you know when you're in network marketing, you're in love with your company. You're all in True. when you're all in, you know. And when I got, I just got that news probably that maybe that same day I met you, you know, and I had to make a decision of whether I was gonna panic or whether I'd flip it. I just be completely positive. And I knew that as a leader, people look to you in order to find out what they need to do. It's kind of like when you're on an airplane and there's heavy turbulence, the first people you look to are not the people around you because they're the ones panicking with you. You flight look at the flight attendants and yeah. they're calm. When they're calm, you're calm. Those yeah, are exactly the leaders. Yeah. That's what they're trained to do. You know. So for me, I knew I had to be the leader in that situation because people were calling me and panicking, even my directs that are your upline. You know? And I remember thinking, I made the decision just to be completely positive. And I went and I, I did research even at th that day. I wanted to find out about the owners in the company. And I saw that this was an incredible company, billion dollar company, the owners, the founders, CEO of the year, um, incredible product line. 
an even bigger opportunity because we're going to go from 14 countries to over 140 countries. Like, man, the sky is the limit here. And I just remember being so excited. I remember telling Danny and Stefania, look at Stefania, all of your women in Italy and everything, they're going to jump all over all these products, you know? And I remember telling, you know, all the guys with that, we're going to rebrand the, the mint line and all these other products, you know, and we're going to still have those products. And um, now we have an even bigger product offering. How great is it? And then everybody just went pop, flipped the script to positive. And I think we had one of our biggest months ever in network marketing. That first day we launched our team into that into that business, you know? It was but, one, um, one we very, very big strategy which, which changed our lives. And I think um, what we can say here is what Tony Robbins always mentions is uh, the leader gives clarity. Mm. So and, and we had that clarity from the top that we knew where we were going. Because honestly, the company, like our old company, yeah. They had no clue what we were. <laughs> I, I remember that one convention we had. Yeah. Like the last convention, actually. I remember that too. It was a mess. I it mean, was we had in that, Spain. Yeah, we had that big hall and there were around, whatever, like 2,000 people, 3,000 people instead of eight because yeah. so many people were shocked. Mm -hmm. And then they brought a speaker in from the new company. He didn't even know what was going to happen because <laughs> everything was like behind the scenes. Yeah. But uh, so what brought us through that time was the clarity we had. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why we exploded. And yes. Like, like this team we've built. Right now, it's, uh, I mean, it's crazy. We've built so many new billionaires. Exactly. Uh, so many new people who changed their life through an additional income, part-time income. It's just crazy. And we're still getting started. Like I mentioned in the beginning, we just came from Egypt. 20,000 people in a stadium at a team event. Exactly. The biggest team imagine. event I've ever had in my, in my uh, entire life. It's, you know? it's crazy, yeah. Yeah, but like I said, um, but I'm constantly, I would say, rebuilding my business. Even though today I have a business that people would freaking kill for you know I'm, I'm very grateful for where i am today but i'm always in that build mode because i know that if i'm not building my team won't be building you know i i have leaders on my and obviously that i that are personally in line to me that are millionaires in this business but they still look to me as the example they still want to see i'm sponsoring people i'm winning the trips i'm getting new leaders i'm breaking new pin ranks that's what motivates them to go do the same thing so i i don't lead with my words i lead with my actions because I'm a strong believer in that people don't listen to what you say. They are watching what you do, right? Mm -hmm. They listen with their eyes, not their ears. And so I'm always about just leading by action. You know, I'm always having to set up personal goals. I want to still feel confident. I, I still want to feel relevant in this industry as I'm getting older. And 13 years now has passed since I started. There are new people coming in uh, that are having a lot of success. You know, I still want to be that relevant guy, Calvin Becerra. And so I'm still building hard. You know, I made a personal goal uh, just this last year to build in my market again in the United States and just crush it there. And now, you know, just in the last month, I broke two of the biggest pin ranks in the United States. You know, uh, I rebuilt the team again, like I did in my last company in India, you know, and I had the two, uh, two biggest teams in all of India. There are all these top guys in my company traveling to India to the market over and over again each month. I haven't even had to, had to go there. I know how to support my team from where I live, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, um, it's just, but I'm, but I'm, you're, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to be successful, you have to constantly be in agreement with yourself that you're going to be rebuilding and rebuilding, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I don't have to do it anymore, but this business is so fun. It motivates me. It drives me when I'm having success. Mm -hmm. Two questions to wrap it up. Okay. So question number one. Um, so if we have somebody who's listening who is in network marketing already and just just got started or maybe is on a plateau, what's your tip? Um, if someone's just getting started, I would say the biggest tip I can give you is to be servant driven. Be constantly in service to your team, to the people that are around you. Let them know how much you care, you know, uh, because when people know that you really care about them, they want to go to work for you. They want to impress you. They want to show off what they can do because they know how much you care about them, you know? So I would say oh, always be servant-driven and be available for your people. Uh, I'm constantly traveling around the world when I don't have to. No one makes me travel, you know? Uh, I pay for myself traveling around the world, but I'm constantly finding out where people need me, where they want me, when you're going to do, do a tour, if you ever need me, if you need me to go on my, on, on my own, if you need me to jump on a podcast or a webinar or do a Zoom call with you, like constantly letting your team know that you appreciate everything they're doing every single day behind the scenes when you're not looking and you want to you want to do whatever they need from you. I want to offer myself wherever you need me, you know? Mm -hmm. So just be in appreciation and be in service to your team. And when somebody is on the plateau, let's say like for a few years in network marketing, they reached a certain income, but they're just not growing anymore. Do you have a tip for those kind of people? Um, man, if they're not growing anymore, they've reached the plateau. Uh, I would just say what I mentioned already in the podcast, you know, find a way to reinvent yourself again. You know, look for any opportunity, any open window to reinvent yourself mm -hmm. again, to rebuild again, so you can motivate your team. You know, just because uh, you've reached a plateau and uh, you feel like, you know, you're not growing anymore. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that your team can't. So you need to, you need to figure out uh, a way to, to, um, to bring yourself 
up to the top again, you know? Like I said, uh, whenever your company launches a new product, there's an opportunity for you to grow in a huge way. Uh, when your company opens a new country, there's an opportunity for you to go figure out how to meet new people in that country, in your space, build relationships until you come to a point where they want to join your opportunity. Uh, you know, um, uh, sponsor a few people again, get, get that excitement back, you know, and understand your numbers. Don't get depressed when someone joins you again and doesn't get started because that's happened to you hundreds of times already. It's just part of the process, you know, uh, set your own personal goals. When the company offers a new incentive trip, make sure you win it. That's your focus right now is just focusing on the next 90 days to get on that trip, mm -hmm. to show your team, to impress them, to impress yourself, you know, like look for opportunities to re-motivate yourself again, but to reinvent yourself, mm -hmm. to bring yourself back to life. I always like to say there's no problem in network marketing which you cannot solve with new people. Right, exactly. True, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, whenever I meet someone who's depressed in network marketing, I say, don't worry, you'll get over it. Go sign up a new person. Hey, exactly. <laughs> last question, because this was actually one question, like kind of hidden in one, in one phrase. Uh, last question for today. So if somebody does not know what network marketing is, it's, it's, it's inspired by your story and says, okay, but what the hell is this guy talking about? What is network marketing? And maybe how can I find my way into it? So how do you explain to a new person what network marketing uh, is? Network marketing, um, I don't try to, when someone asks me about network marketing, what most people do is they try to like go through their whole opportunity or something, you know, they, they need a short, simple answer, you know. I try to keep it very simple for them and very fluid, you know. And I just let them know that network marketing is just, um, uh, you know, is just building a group of people, building a team of people who all want the same as you do. They want a, a passive income stream. They want an additional income stream so it could change their life for the better, okay. But network marketing is just a group of people who are all focused on building a passive income, but all committed to just using that company's products, all right? That's all it is. All we are is we're, we're looking for people who want more out of life, who want to earn a passive income, and we all make one commitment, com one commitment to each other to use the products every month. That's it. It's so simple because that's all I, my business is all around the world. I have millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people um, every single month that are just ordering and using their own product, and that's paying everyone all the way up the mm -hmm. line. You know, and we're, we're all motivating each other. We're filling this thing up with personal development, with value for our teams. We're helping them grow more as people uh, so they can do better in all areas of their life. But all we're really doing is using a product every month. That's it. And we're building a passive income the bigger our team grows. Calvin, it was a pleasure having you on the podcast. Thanks for having me, uh, Fabi. I appreciate it. I know you're looking at the watch already because your driver's <laughs> picking you up. You have to run through the airport, to seven hour flight, off to the next event. Cool. I can't wait for the next one though. So thanks, Fabi. appreciate yeah. you. We're going to do more in the future for sure. All right. So... That's it for today. Thanks uh, very much to Kelvin Becerra joining us on the podcast. Uh, stay tuned for the next one. God bless and see you soon. See you. I hope you guys enjoyed it.